Okay. You can all see that. Great. Uh, well, I wrote my PhD dissertation on disguises in medieval narratives, and what I ended up finding more interesting than the disguises themselves were the questions these narratives raised about perception, how we perceive things, how we manipulate what others perceive, and who in the room can pierce through the layers of deception and see the truth. So for the next little while, I want to talk to you about a particular set of narrative motifs that I have found repeated over and over again in medieval romances. Motifs that deal with disguise, perception, and how medieval people thought memory worked. In medieval disguise narratives spanning several centuries, it is almost always the woman in the room who can co correctly identify the disguised person in front of her when the men in the room cannot. This struck me as an odd narrative pattern, and it suggests a gendered view, a medieval gendered view of perceptiveness, that medieval authors and audiences thought that women were somehow naturally better or socialized to be better at recognizing people, piercing through lies, and detecting the truth. So before I go any further, I want to take a moment to define two terms, romance and motif. Uh, romance is a medieval literary genre. It's not the bodice-ripping love and happily ever afters romance genre we have today, though there is often a marriage in it. Rather, it's the precursor to the novel, following one protagonist through a series of adventures. A motif is a recurring thematic element. It can be an image, a trope, or a small, small narrative unit a tiny bit of plot that gets repeated. You can have motifs which are repeated intratextually, that is, throughout a single narrative, like the image of the eyes of Dr. Eckelberg repeated throughout The Great Gatsby. Or you can have motifs which are repeated intertextually, that is, across several narratives. It might only appear once in a story, but it will appear frequently across a genre. You might be more familiar with the term trope from tvtropes.org, which categorizes motifs such as the mad scientist, the best friend's betrayal, or the curse or monster which has been dormant for years but has now been awakened. So when I talk about recognition motifs, I am referring to scenes in which a person in disguise is recognized, and the patterns within those scenes that get repeated across several texts. Also, as a forewarning, I am going to be name dropping a lot of medieval romance titles. I don't expect you to know any of them, and I've done my best to try to summarize the salient parts of each of their plots, but if you're interested in reading more about them, a good place to start is at middleenglishromance.org.uk. And now to my main argument. So there are three types of narratives in the medieval romances in which the woman is presented with a person in disguise, often after the disguised person has been absent for a long time. Those in which the woman recognizes the person in disguise with the aid of a token of recognition, this is the most common narrative of the three, those in which the woman accurately perceives the identity of the person in disguise without the aid of a visual cue, which is the second most common narrative, and those rare occasions on, in which a woman is taken in by the disguise. And I'll talk about each one of these in turn. So, recognition aided by mnemonic tokens. Memory studies how it worked and what techniques one could use to improve it were a deeply important part of medieval culture. This is not all that surprising when you consider that most of the population was illiterate and books and parchment were prohibitively expensive. You couldn't just jot down your to-do list, your grocery list, or buy a few copies of your favorite stories. You had to remember them. 
Medieval memory culture is influential in shaping many disguised recognition episodes in romance. The frequent employment of the token of recognition motif in many of these narratives provides evidence of this. That is, the woman in question does not at first recognize the hero. So what Bruce Loudon calls a delayed recognition. Rather, an object triggers her recognition, most often a ring exchanged earlier between the woman and her lover, who is now the one in disguise. These recognition tokens operate as what Elizabeth Van Houts refers to as pegs for memory. Memories of people or events were often linked to or imprinted upon objects. A piece of jewelry, an article of clothing, a decorative object in the home, or something similar. Seeing those objects could then trigger the recollection of the memories with which they were associated. Think of digging through an old box in your attic and coming across the friendship bracelet you made when you were 10. That bracelet would have a whole host of childhood memories imprinted upon it, and seeing the bracelet would call up those old memories. What I have found is that the frequent pres presence of these memory triggering objects in medieval romance disguised recognition scenes points to these literary women's perspicacity as a matter more of recollection than perception. The, uh, the romance of Sir Isambras provides a good example of the use of mnemonic objects in recognition scenes. It also demonstrates the endurance of this recognition motif and concept of object as mnemonic device through the late Middle Ages and into the early modern period. The narrative was composed sometime before 1320, and the surviving manuscripts show a continued interest in the text. The nine surviving manuscripts date from the mid 14th century through the late 15th century. And moreover, the provenances of these manuscripts range from Southwest Sussex up to into Northern Yorkshire, suggesting a widespread and continuous interest in this tale. It's a somewhat winding story, so I will only focus on the parts of the plot which are relevant to my discussion today. About midway through the text, the wife of Sir Isambras, about to be forcibly taken from him by the antagonist, slips him a ring as a token by which to remember and presumably find her. The antagonist, who in this story is the Sultan, then gives Sir Isambras a bag of gold in exchange for his wife. Later, Isambras encounters his wife whilst he is disguised as a palmer, which is a Christian pilgrim who has visited holy sites in the Palestinian region. In one version of Sir Isambras, the ring is produced as a mnemonic for Isambras's wife. Other later versions lack this manuscript's continuity, which is not unusual for medieval manuscripts. They often got muddled up as they were recopied and recopied. So some other versions conflate the ring with the Sultan's red cloth bag filled with gold that he gave to Sir Isambras when he first parted with his wife. The red bag of gold makes a reappearance in the recognition scene rather than the ring. However, the importance of including a recognition token and the inclusion of a mnemonic performance by the wife remains consistent, regardless of what that object is. It's not a ring that's important, it's a mnemonic token in general that is important to include in the scene. Seeing the ring or the gold-filled bag, she experiences a strong emotional response, followed by recognition of the object and recollection of the hero. She sees the ring or bag of gold, swoons, reawakens, then kisses the item several times. She then tells a nearby knight the story of how she and Isambras were separated and tells him to send that Palmer to, to see her. Or in this case, you know, the Palmer being Sir Isambras in disguise. Uh, as in other female recognition scenes in the romances, this is followed by the hero's affirmation of his identity. Isambras, in his disguise, comes into the hall. She demands to know how he came across the object, and then, recognizing him, he affirms his identity, and they are joyfully reunited. <laughs> 
considering then that the multiple recopies of the tail, the mnemonic ob in the multiple recopies of the tail, the mnemonic object retains its relevance and that it is necessary in these recopies to include a visual cue for the queen rather, rather than specifically the ring, it is clear that the memory imprinted upon the object and often the performativity that accompanies this imprinting, and not necessarily the emotionality of the object alone that is what is essential to her perceptiveness. So object-driven recognition in the medieval period was heavily gender-associated, with the exception of a tale called Amas and Amalun, which is a tale between two men that I will discuss later, Object-triggered recognition in English romance is exclusively the domain of women. Professor Anne Lester has discussed medieval women's association with the care and keeping of relics and the cultivation of the association of those objects with memories of lost male spouses and relatives. She points out how crusaders sent relics and reliquaries specifically to their spouses or female kin. These objects would then encode memories of the absent crusaders. Often these objects were anchored to texts, charters, necrologies, letters, and lections that affirmed the connection between relics and crusaders and that inscribed and informed their collective memory. Of course, many of these romances were composed when increasing literacy enabled text to encode memory without the aid of a mnemonic object, and objects were losing much of their relevance in official capacities. People would affix their seals to written oaths and legal tracts rather than swear upon an object in front of witnesses charged with remembering the occasion. However, as eminent scholar Michael Clanchy has found, Objects continued to be used occasionally, though are not favored in oath-taking and proof of identity issues, at least into the early 14th century. Personal possessions certainly carried and continue to carry emotional, if not legal, relevance. Encoding a memory of one's spouse upon, for instance, a wedding ring is more likely and more common than encoding it on the marriage certificate. Almost without exception, the disguised person is someone with whom the woman shares a strong emotional, social, and sometimes sexual bond, usually the woman's beloved or husband. This female identification role extends beyond the confines of the romance genre, or even contemporary medieval literature as a whole. Women, far more than men, were tasked with remembering and by extension identifying family and near kin relations, both in the legal courts and in commemorating those lost to the community. Uh, Brona Kane has discussed the, I think I have a slide on this, not quite, um, the social representations of gender prevalent in witness testimony, arguing that a fusion of emotional and biological factors produced a gender-based social representation of female memory that resulted in female witnesses being preferred in specific types of lawsuits, indicating that women's memory was valued in certain jur juridical contexts, specifically suits that required memories of births and proofs of sexual activity. PJP Goldberg also noted that in marriage and defamation litigation, women deponents were used in preference to men, particularly in the 14th and early 15th centuries, when many of these romances were composed. Now, Sue Niebrzydowski noted that in a 1365 York trial regarding the legitimacy of Alistair Rochliffe's marriage to John Murray's on the grounds that Alice was possibly underage at the time of marriage, women were overwhelmingly more likely to reference objects as memory pegs for the event, whereas male testimony repeatedly used the church calendar year as a, a memorial marker. In fact, only one female witness connected Alice's birth with a national event, whereas other testators remembered seeing the cradle in which Alice slept or other objects present at the birth, such as the gift of, gift of a prayer script. Now, drawing on Becky R. Lee's work on legal proofs of age in chancery court records that 
even amongst the nobility, only 106 out of 1,019 chancery records mentioned postpartum purification. Niebuhr Sadovsky concludes that, and here I'm quoting, uh, the attendance at one of these purification celebrations was more likely to become embedded in a woman's memory than a man's, and finds that it is female memory of childbirth that provides the most persuasive evidence in Rowcliffe versus Murray's. So from this case study and studies of similar trial records, she concludes that in the medieval period, the preservation and transmission of family history as evoked by objects and persons within the household was, as also suggested by Matthew Innes, a role carried out by women. The gendered association of object anchored memory and of women as superior witnesses, specifically in cases centering around questions of identity, including in the case of Rowcliffe versus Murray's age and birth as aspects of identity, is also displayed in the romances when one considers the choice of memory objects in recognition scenes. Now, Elizabeth Van Houts argues that historically, jewelry and swords in particular were favored for commemoration of absent or lost husbands and male relatives. The self-same objects which most frequently appear as mnemonic pegs in literary narratives. The type of object selected in each romance usual, is usually appropriate to the nature of the relationship between the disguised person or lost slash transformed person, um, as in the case of Leila Frayne, which I'll talk about, talk about in a minute, and the perceiver. Rings as recognition tokens, for example, appear in Torrent of Portingale, which was written around 1400. Uh, King Horn, which was written at the end of the 13th century. Horn Child and Maiden Remnild, which was written around 1320. And the history of the Holy Grail, which was composed circa 1420, in addition to Sir Ezem Ross. They generally denote an erotic relationship between the two characters, a sexual or pseudo-sexual bond as between spouses and lovers, including chaste paramours. This is in keeping with some evidence of contemporary uses of rings found outside of romances. So take, for instance, the exchange of a ring love token discussed in a letter from Richard Call to Marguerite Paston in 1469, to real-life gentry-class individuals from well-off families whose letters have remarkably survived to the modern era. This letter, dating from 1469, regards a man posing as a messenger from Marjorie, likely employed by those who sought to expose their secret romance. It says, he, the, mes the messenger, told me John Thresher came to him in your name and said that you sent him to my lad asking for a letter or a token, which I should have sent you, but he did not trust him. He would not give him any such thing. After that, he brought him a ring saying that you sent it to him, commanding him that he should deliver the letter or token to him. I believe, as does my assistant, that it was not sent by you. Rather, it was a plot by my master and Sir James to uncover our affair. Rings were likely favored as mnemonic tokens because of their small size and portability. And their high monetary value also likely made them more valued as keepsakes. So in Robin Hood and the Potter, a ballad and not a romance, it um this the sorry, uh, Robin Hood and the Potter, ballad, not a romance, uh, also incorporates the gift of a ring into an erotic disguise encounter. Robin, dressed as a potter, seduces the sheriff's wife. The next morning, uh, he took leave of the sheriff's wife and thanked her for everything. Lady, if you will wear this on my behalf, I give you here a gold ring. I mean, this is, everything is a sexual pun. The thing meant what it does today, but it was also a slang term for women's genitalia. So Robin is thanking the sheriff's wife for all things. Now, while the author does not explicitly state that the two committed adultery, the gift of the ring with its connotation as a lover's token leaves no doubt in the audience's mind what took place between Robin and the sheriff's wife. 
In an outlaw ballad, this episode is, of course, a parody of noble courting rituals, and the ring thus represents less emotional commitment than its romance equivalent. It seems to operate more like a sexual calling card, much as Absalom's offer of a ring to Allison in Geoffrey Chaucer's The Miller's Tale is intended as a presumptuous claim on Allison's affections rather than a symbol of mutually shared emotional bonds. And those, as those affections are unreciprocated, it is not accepted. So this Robin Hood ballad is a later work than most of the romances under discussion here today. It was composed around 1500, whereas most of the English romances were composed in the mid 13th to mid 15th centuries. It has also been recognized by Stephen Knight and Thomas Olgren as structurally and thematically complex, but stylistically simple and a much less skillful work of literary composition than others of its ilk. As the romance genre evolved over some few centuries and lent motifs to other genres, as with this ballad, it is entirely possible that this ballad's author included the ring as a common romance motif but did not recognize that in romance, the ring functions like a Chekhov's gun. An exchange of tokens seen earlier in the tale traditionally needed to be tied to an accompanying recognition scene, recognition scene later in the narrative. Analysis of this particular disguise and token scene is frustrated by the ambiguity of the reaction of the sheriff's wife to her husband's discovery of Robin's true identity. When her husband reveals that Robin has once again outwitted him, the sheriff's wife starts guffawing with laughter. The wife's reaction makes clear her lack of spousal sympathy, but in displacing the recognition scene onto the sheriff rather than his wife, as would be typical in the romance genre, the ballad draws a veil over whether or not she was aware that the potter she took under her roof was Robin, and thus over the extent of um, and thus draws a veil over the extent of her spousal deviousness. Did she originally believe she was entertaining a mere potter? Or did she recognize Robin and deliberately choose him as a lover, knowing him to be her husband's nemesis? The ballad remains ambiguous. Now, in Arthurian legend, Sir Marhalt's sword fragment in the Tristan cycle similarly operates as a revelatory device. It is similarly appropriate to the nature of the relationship between Isolde's mother and the disguised hero. So let me pause for a moment here and define a term. Legend ha legends have what we call cycles, which are collections of stories told by numerous authors over a large span of time that all collectively tell the story of a character or group of characters like Tristan and Isolde, or Charlemagne tales, or Br'er Rabbit and Anansi stories, or Coyote and Raven tales. Let's say that in Arthurian legend, perhaps a couple stories only tell of Arthur pulling the sword from the stone and his coronation, and another tells the story of his wedding to Guinevere, and then three more tell the story of the quest for the Holy Grail, but have slightly different tellings and two others contain wildly different versions of his fi final battle. These collectively tell the story of King Arthur's life, and so they form the Arthurian cycle. So, as I was saying, uh, in Arthurian legend, Sir Marhalt's sword fragment in the Tristan cycle similarly operates as a revelatory device, as the lover's rings do in other romances. Furthermore, it is similarly appropriate to the nature of the relationship between Isolde's mother and the disguised hero. Now, Sir Tristan has been masquerading as Tremtrist, which is a delightfully obvious pseudonym, in the hostile kingdom of Ireland shortly after he has killed the brother of the Irish queen in combat. When, and here I'm going to quote from Mallory's version of the King Arthur Tales, though you can find it in other versions of the Tales of Sir Tristan. Uh, the queen looked at his sword as it lay upon his bed, and then, as misfortune would have it, the queen drew out his sword from its sheath and looked at it a long while. And both she and her daughter thought it a very beautiful sword, but a foot and a half from the point, 
there was a large piece broken off from the edge. And when the queen saw that gap in the sword, she remembered a piece of sword that was found in the brain pan of Sir Marhalt, her brother. Alas, she said to her daughter Isolde, this is the same traitor knight that killed my brother, your uncle. Now swords, historically and in the romances, especially Arthurian romances, are valuable objects frequently associated with masculine lineage. The inheritance of a sword from father or other pater paternal figure to son is a key motif in the Sir Percival cycle and present in other moments in Arthurian romances, such as Arthur's gift of swords to his nephews, Gawain and Harriet. As Marholt was the queen's brother, a ring closely associated with erotic love would not be appropriate. As it is through her male family member that the queen and Tristan are connected, a sword is an appropriate peg on which to imprint her memory of the circumstances and people surrounding Marholt's death. Moreover, the queen is shown preserving the sword fragment, much as the historical women in Anne Lester's research kept memory tokens of their male, male relatives in a coffer, which is similar to a reliquary. The nature of the object itself evokes a relic. The piece of sword that was pulled out of Sir Marhalt's brain pan after he died is a fragmentary object connected directly to his death and to his physical materiality, much like a splinter of the true cross or the piece of St. Thomas Becket's skull at Canterbury Cathedral. Now the choice of a textile as the recognition token in the romance of Leigh Lafrain, which I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, further events is this link between the material nature of a recognition token and the relationship between perceiver and disguised individual. And here is where that earlier definition I gave of medieval romances as precursors to the novel, rather than being about lovey-dovey romance, becomes relevant. Leila Lafrain is a story about twin sisters and their mother, of familial love, not erotic love. Le uh, Lafrain is given up as a baby and raised in a convent, unaware of her parentage. Later in life, having left the convent, she is unwittingly present at the wedding of her twin sister and selflessly lays down the blanket she was once swaddled with on the wedding bed as a gift. Now, her mother, quote, when she saw the blanket, fainted, end quote, and when she awakens, cries out to her daughter in recognition. This is a transformation rather than a disguise because Lafrain didn't put on a mask, she grew up, but the, mechanism, the mechanisms of recognition remain the same. As a baby, Lafrain is in fact left with two tokens and this blanket and this ring you gave me long ago as a token of your love. The ring seems to have been included due to its popularity as a recognition token, specifically associated with love generally, whether between lovers or child and parent. However, the author's focus is on the blanket and it is the blanket alone that actually functions as a recognition token. Unlike the gender neutral ring, a blanket is a feminine object insofar as women were primarily, women were primarily associated with textile making and embellishment but more so as this blanket is a baby blanket and thus invokes the mother-daughter relationship and so is more appropriate than the ring as the mnemonic token in this narrative. The mother's gloves and father's sword in the tale Sir Degare function similarly, the clothing representing the maternal link to Sir Degare and the sword representing the paternal link, allowing him as an adult to be reunited with his long lost parents or parent, rather. I think the father's dead in that one. Uh, in Le Lafrain, Lafrain's mother swoons twice upon recognizing the blanket and her daughter. Displays of overwhelming emotion are present in many other romances, recognition moments as well, particularly fainting and weeping. Now, in her research on medieval memory culture, Mary Carruthers has discussed the medieval belief of the importance of emotional accompaniment to memory retention and recall, pain as well as affection, sometimes referred to in medieval works on memory by the Latin terms passio or affectio animi. As Carruthers explains, 
the word in which Arist the word which Aristotle uses to classify the memorial phantasm is pathos, translated by William of Morbeck as passio. The pathos, the painful emotion, imprints in the soul a kind, as a kind of image, the having of which we call a memory. Since it is a physical change or effect, a recollection or memory phantasm is also an affection or strong emotion. Memory and emotion are inseparably linked. Medieval theologians, did I? There. Now, uh, medieval theologians and philosophers, Thomas Aquinas, Francis of Assisi, and Thomas of Celano all had discussed the role of effect in memory recall, effect being emotions. Uh, Carruthers summarizes their points, saying effectus, or emotion, uh, in this description is the agent by means of which rumination and memorization take place. In other words, remembering is an activity in which the emotions must be engaged in order for it to occur at all. It is appropriate, then, that almost without exception, the disguised person is the woman's beloved child or husband, as mentioned above, they share a strong emotional bond. In these recognition scenes, with or without the presence of recognition tokens, the hero appearing in front of his beloved or her, and her nearly wedded husband, always the romance's primary antagonist, is a test of her loyalty as much as it is a mechanism by which the hero can launch a dramatic surprise attack against those inside the castle. Her ability to recognize him despite his disguise is a testament to the strength of her affection for him. She has proven to have kept her love for him alive through his absence, as the strength of that emotion allows her to access memories of him so strong that they allow her to penetrate his altered appearance. Now, in the later romance, uh, later 13th romance, th ooh, uh, later 13th century romance, which is not late at all, it's actually quite early, uh, later 13th century romance, King Horn, the heroine Riminild gives the hero Horn a ring, quote, for my love, with instructions to look at it and think upon your sweetheart, if he finds himself in need of courage. The author demonstrates the ring's effectiveness as a mnemonic token in a poignant moment on the battlefield, well before it is brought into play at the climactic moment of disguise revelation. And here you go, it says, he smote the Saracens, his blood ran hot. At every blow, heads came off. Though the cannon burst sur surround him, Horn stood alone. He looked on the ring and thought of Riminild. This tender moment of solitude and recollection that the author inserts in the midst of the heat and noise of battle establishes the ring as an object imbued with emotional significance private to Horn and Riminild. It moreover demonstrates the strength of Horn's affections for Riminild, such that the ring can trigger a memory of her so strong as to leave the hero alone, even in the middle of a battle. Thus, when he returns to the kingdom in disguise and presents Riminild with the, king, with the ring by dropping it into her cup, the scene becomes a test of Riminild's enduring infections for Horn through her ability to recollect him. The centrality of the ring as testing device of Riminild's emotional fidelity to Horn is made clear from the moment Horn enters the kingdom. A palmer he meets informs him that Riminild is engaged to be married to another, a king named Modi, suggesting a breach in her faithfulness to Horn. However, this news is immediately undercut by the palmer informing Horn that, quote, no one could avoid noticing that she wept ceaselessly. She pro proclaimed that she would never be married with a gold ring. She said she already had a husband, even though he had been away. And she's being a bit liberal here with the term husband. She and Horn aren't married yet. She's using the term to demonstrate her emotional bond with him. So Riminhold's specific refusal of a gold wedding ring as a synecdoche, an equating of her unwillingness to marry King Modi, strengthens the connection between Horn's ring and her emotional fidelity to him. <laughs> 
Later at the wedding feast, when Riminald first spies Horn's ring in her cup, she is filled with dread. Not that Horn might have come back to discover her impending marriage to King Modi, but that Horn might be Isterv, uh, dead. Her fidelity is finally proven when, overcome with grief at the sight of the ring, she fell on her bed where her knife was hidden. She planned to kill both the king and herself. Now, while she isn't quite given that definitive recognition moment, perceiving Horn's true identity in his Palmer's disguise, her recollection triggered by the sight of the token serves as proof of her emotional fidelity to him. These tokens are objects imprinted with both memories and emotions. Retaining a token after many years apart signifies one's fidelity. Losing or regifting it or forgetting its significance would imply a transfer of emotions of affections to someone new. Now, it's important to note that women's perceptive abilities are not exclusively dependent upon object-anchored memory in the romances. Archistrata in Apollonius of Tyre recognizes her husband after a 14-year absence while he fails to recognize her in her priestess's robes. I think the quote is, uh, uh, So she knew him well, he didn't know her. In the Alexander romances, Queen Candace, suspecting her visitor is not who he claims to be, recalls an image, uh, I think it's a metal statue, that she had commissioned out of her love for Alexander in his likeness sometime previously, and immediately discerns that the man before her is Alexander, even though he has come to her disguised as Antigone, uh, which is one of Alexander's noblemen. Women's authority as witnesses uh, has biblical precedence, notably in the Passion, Burial, and Resurrection. While men participate in the Passion and Burial, wetting Christ's lips with a wine-soaked sponge or carrying the body to the tomb, the women watch the proceedings, and when the tomb is discovered to be empty, it is the women who first see the risen Christ and who carry knowledge of his resurrection to the disciples. Now, women's limited mobility in the romance genre means that female characters are more likely to be confronted by a disguised person returning to the community than men are to be confronted with women in disguise. The knight rides out of court, or the young heir is cast out in usurpation and returns to his lands after many adventures. The woman remains behind, confined and surrounded by those who know her well. But arguing that women only perceived more disguises than men because of this limited mobility fails to take into account the number of instances in which a man in a similar situation fails to recognize a person he knows well. Now, as mentioned earlier, Apollonius, returning to his family, fails to recognize his wife, though she recognizes him immediately. In a chapter I wrote in a book that will be published this spring, uh, I discuss a staggering number of scenes in medieval tales in which kings fail to recognize other individuals in disguise. And I am sorely disappointed that I couldn't under, uh, couldn't attend Dr. Moffat's symposium talk yesterday. Uh, it sounds like his talk and mine dovetail nicely, and he discussed a number of instances where knights fail to recognize each other. So, uh, <clears throat> So in the romance genre, men are consistently depicted as less perceptive than women. Amis and Amalun, that romance I mentioned earlier, which focuses on two men that I promised to discuss again, confirms this. The romance follows the pattern of the revelation narrative with the token of recognition motif, with Amis queerly placed in the usually female role. The emotional performances of Amis and Amalun are similar to those of the women in the aforementioned romances. They weep and swoon at their initial separation, and Amas weeps and swoons again at their reunion. Amas gives Amalun one of a matching set of golden cups, evocative of loving cups, at their departure, and the object features prominently in their reunion. These elements, the narrative pattern, the token motif, the emotional performances, 
match those found in the majority of female male disguised reunions that I've been discussing. However, there is a key difference. Even when presented with the cup, Amos does not successfully recognize the disguised beggar Amalun. Even at his wife's suggestion that, you know, the man before you is Amalun, Amos refuses to entertain the possibility that it is his long lost friend. In this, Amos presents as feminine, but not female. Queer in his emotional performance, queer in his earlier presentation of remembrance tokens, but ultimately masculine in his imperceptions. So here we have failure to recognize another person. The few, very few narratives in which the woman fails to recognize a person in disguise, far from undermining this pattern of presenting women as social memory keepers or more perceptive than men, in fact, strengthen it. Igraine and in Arthurian romances and the Duchess of Austria in the romance Sir Gauther are both raped by individuals disguised as their respective husbands and fail to detect the disguise until their rapists reveal themselves. However, these are supernatural disguises. In Tales of King Arthur's Conception, Merlin enchants his biological father, uh, Arthur's biological father, King Uther, to look like Igraine's husband and so deceive her into sleeping with him. And in the romance Sir Gauther, a devil takes on the duke's form, thus leading to the unholy conception of the titular character. The author uses the supernatural aspect of the disguises to excuse the women from not fulfilling their duty of familial recognition properly, or else leave their degree of culpability for adulterous sexual activity deliberately ambiguous. So Sir Thomas Mallory, author of one of the most famous versions of the King Arthur narrative, achieves this exoneration largely through silence. During Uther's infiltration of the castle and rape of a grain, the audience is not privy to a grain's point of view. Her thoughts are only introduced after Uther has left and she is told of the death of her husband prior to their sexual union. She, quote, marveled, which here can be taken as fretted and wondered, uh, who it might have been who laid with her, a man who looked just like her husband. So she mourned privately and said nothing. Her emotional reactions, first marveling, then mourning, establish her blamelessness. The encounter therefore becomes as much a testament to Igraine's integrity and fidelity to her husband, Gorlois, as to the power of Merlin's magic. He can disguise a man so well that a woman cannot distinguish him from her own husband. The narrative's delay of Igraine's confession of her doubts to the man's professed identity that generally accompanies a disguise encounter further solidifies her blamelessness, as she is reluctant to tell Uther, who is now her husband, of the child's paternity. If she had suspected Uther, she would have been more willing to divulge the puzzling circumstances of Arthur's conception. Now, furthermore, the emotional force of her reaction, um, that is, I think she, the queen made great joy. She makes great joy. Uh, the, the emotional force of her reaction following Uther's revelation that he is in fact the father of her child proves her integrity. Conversely, Raluca Radulescu and Margaret Robson discuss in depth the ambiguity created by the author of Sir Gauther surrounding the Duchess of Austria's failure to recognize a devil in disguise. They note that her prayer to God and Marim Wild should guff her grass to have a child on what manner shall no wrath, uh, to God and the Virgin Mary that they should give her a child she didn't care how suggests a willingness to turn a blind eye to the devil's true identity. Raluca Radulescu has discussed the political implications of the Duchess's rape and subsequent attempt to disguise the extramarital conception from her husband. 
She points out that Queen Margaret of Anjou, after eight years of marriage without producing an heir, conceived just before her husband, Henry VI, entered a catatonic state, sparking frequent rumors about her adultery, though Radulescu notes that most of the rumors were in fact indirect Yorkist criticism of the king. Margaret Robson agrees with Radulescu that the scene points to paternity and its abuses, as well as its large-scale consequences, but holds that the scene holds the scene to be more applicable to a general gentry and noble audience, and especially female audience, than concerned particularly with the royal house. Robson concludes that the narrative is not explicit. In fact, it is positively cagey as to whether or not the lady was aware that the man was not her husband. But I would suggest that it implies that she was aware. We know that her husband had declared his intention of wasting no more time on her. We know that she is desperate for a child by any means. And we know that she is outside the court. She is not being deceived, but is allowing herself to appear to be deceived for her own ends. Now, Robson's argument for the Duchess not being deceived, but allowing, to her, allowing herself to appear to be deceived is strong. But as Sir Gather is a romance deeply concerned with questions of both piety and penitence, I'm more inclined to believe the author leaves her degree of culpability ambiguous to open up audience interpretation and debate. Do desire and desperation necessarily equate to willing a willingness to sin? If one's prayers to the Virgin Mary are answered by a devil, does that indicate a fault in the Duchess? Or is the intent to draw a parallel between her piety and suffering and Job's? Perhaps the incorporation of a different motif, the rash promise motif uh, here, when she says by any means necessary, functions less as a political or social commentary, but rather as a folkloric warning against hasty and ill-considered promises. The lack of affection between the Duke and his wife is notable. If the ability to correctly identify an individual is proportionally bound to the strength of affection between the intended victim and the disguised person, then it is unsurprising that a woman deprived of her husband's affection should fail to distinguish a false representation of him from the real man. This is not to say that the author is necessarily concerned with the Duchess, Duchess's entrapment in a loveless marriage. As with many romances, the text is, however, concerned about the legitimacy of children. A duke who does not fulfill his matrimonial duties or leaves his wife emotionally unsatisfied exposes himself to possibilities of cuckoldry and illegitimate heirs. In the case of Sir Gallather, an heir whose, whose fiendish patrilineage leads to the destruction and terrorization of his inherited land and people. So, Undo Your Door, also called The Squire of Low Degree, is the final romance I'm going to discuss today. It's a burlesque parody of the genre and yet still supports the argument that women's perceptiveness is tied to both the role of emotion in memory and of feminine roles in preserving the memories of others. The author of this parodic romance also parodies the motif of the woman remembering and identifying a lost loved one. In this narrative, a treacherous steward overhears an amorous conversation between a lowly squire and the princess of Hungary. He reports them to the king. The steward then attacks the squire, but is killed in the process. Under the king's instruction, the squire leaves. The princess, believing the dead steward to be the squire, weeps over and kisses his corpse daily for seven years until finally the squire returns and the king reveals the identity of the corpse. The princess and squire are wed, the squire is made king, and they live happily until the end of their days. This is a joke story. It's the princess's mourning and commemoration of the dead, a traditional role for women with origins in antiquity, is made ridiculous in its exaggeration. 
She confines herself to her room, renounces all pleasurable activities, and in kissing the embalmed steward daily, does repeatedly to a corpse what she refused to do whilst she believed the squire to be alive. Her failure to correctly identify the steward in squire's clothing extends the parody. It also attests to the social distance between her and the squire, as her affection is not strong enough to trigger accurate recognition. So these disguise recognition narratives as a whole suggest a gendered view of perceptiveness relating to identity. Women in these stories are consistently depicted as more skilled at identity perception than men. This is supported by historical evidence of women placed in legal and social roles as memory keepers of identities. The commonality of the token of recognition motif and emotional performance when viewed in light of contemporary concepts of memory retention, implies that these moments of disguised revelation are primarily acts of recollection stimulated by emotion. These motifs suggest that it is perhaps the social belief that women's emotional intensity facilitates better memory retention and thus identification. Or perhaps these narratives illustrate the self-perpetuating notion that women are more perceptive than men because women were expected and trained to take on the emotional labor of social perception.